ever struggle to solve mazes? There are just so many paths, and the human brain can only try them out one at a time. Next time you're having a hard time solving a maze, try this. Step one, load the maze into your vector graphics editor of choice. Thicken the lines and expand. Step two, take a sheet of aluminum foil and spray paint one side black. Step three, cut the maze out using an industrial laser cutter. Step three B, have great fear and respect for reflective metal in a laser cutter. Step three uh, C, untangle the resulting foil. Step four, connect the start and end of the maze to a power supply. And finally, step five, run electric current through your maze. Congratulations, you have solved a maze with electricity. The average flow of electrons in all of these little bits of foil is following precisely the correct shortest path from the start to the finish of this maze. Oh yeah, that's right. We can't actually see electrons flowing in metals with our eyes. Uh, step six, look at it with a thermal camera. The electric current dissipates its energy as heat inside of the foil maze. And the black spray paint makes an excellent high emissivity surface so we can see the infrared radiation on camera. This video is about electricity. Now you may have heard the phrase path of least resistance to describe how electricity flows. And it's sometimes a very descriptive phrase. But at the end of this video, I'm going to be showing how electricity solves three mazes which each have two valid solutions. So before we get there, take your best guess at what's going to happen. In the meantime, I want to ignore electricity completely and start with water. I saw this great video a couple weeks ago from Steve Mould where he was solving mazes with water. If you haven't seen that, you should totally go watch it because he has some really interesting results in it and I will not be repeating the same setup. Where he had the maze vertical, so gravity pointed this way, I want to point gravity this way. So I built my maze flat. On a related note, if you print out a maze and you make each wall exactly two nozzle diameters thick, it is mesmerizing to watch it print. When I start filling the basin with water here, unsurprisingly, the water starts to fill up the maze, and eventually, some pours out from the finish line. So at some level, the water is clearly solving the maze. Now, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening here. I dyed the water blue so that we can see where it is, but water itself is still really uniform, so we can't see how it's moving. To fix this, I raided the barbecue cabinet and threw some pepper on top. Now, where we see pepper standing still, the water isn't flowing. And where we see individual granules moving, we know they're being dragged along by the water. And awesomely, the only pepper particles that are progressing through the puzzle are the ones that fall along the shortest path solution. Everywhere else, the water is totally stagnant. It may be water that's solving the maze in this case, but it's moving water that reveals the solution. But why does this happen? If we look at an individual junction, water flows in from here, and water could flow out from either here or here. If we look really closely, the water level on this side, the incorrect direction, is the same as the input water level. But the water level over here, past the split along the correct path, is ever so slightly lower. That's why the water flows this way. It's just gravity and water flows downhill, even when that hill is made out of other water. This brings up an interesting point though, because if we look at the water level at the input to the maze and the water level at the output of the maze, clearly there is a change. In fact, the whole correct path of the maze has a steadily decreasing water level that's continuing to make the water flow. Solving this maze takes 110 steps. So if we assume, for simplicity's sake, that the water level drops from 110 to zero throughout the maze, and we assume that someone took the time to type all this into Excel by hand, it would look something like this. We see a steady decline in water level from start to finish along the solution path. But now, what do we do about the rest of it? There are some weird things happening in the real experiment in the rest of the maze. If we look at this wall right here, this water isn't moving and this water isn't moving, but there's a huge step in water height between them. So let's zoom in on that junction from before. 
We know the water was flowing around this bend, and there wasn't any water flowing from this cell to this cell, meaning the water in both had to be the same height. This region is only connected to the solution path at a single location. Other than that, it's totally sealed off. Intuitively then, we know that water can't actually be flowing into this region or it would eventually overfill because there's no output. But physically speaking, if there's no water flowing anywhere within this region, that means the water level has to be exactly the same everywhere within this boundary. If there was any difference in height, gravity would cause some sloshing that would very quickly flatten everything out. The cool thing is that now we can do this for every extra chunk. The water level descends down the primary path, and as long as there's only one solution to the maze, everywhere else in the maze can be thought of as part of one of these enclosed zones. So when we're trying to describe the water level everywhere, we just say that the water down the main path descends, and every isolated chunk becomes a mesa that adopts the height of the water wherever it connects to the primary path. It's like a whole bunch of stagnant lakes connected to the same river. If we look at the example from earlier, with the really deep bit next to the really shallow bit, we can see that the deep part connects to the solution pretty early on, and the really shallow part doesn't connect to the solution until the very end of the maze. It's a beautifully simple solution. At this point, you may very legitimately be saying, yeah, sure, that describes what's happening, but why does it do that? And to understand that, we need to try to perturb this system, change it, and see what happens. If we add a bit of extra water to one of these zones, when we raise the water level, now at this junction we have water flowing out of the enclosed zone, which easily flows towards the finish and backs up towards the start, actually causing water levels in other upstream zones to rise slightly. But, after a few seconds, it's emptied itself out. All the water levels have returned to equilibrium, and again, flow is only proceeding down the main channel. And it's worth noting that the same thing happens in reverse the first time we turn the water on. Anytime we poke this system and perturb the water levels, the system very quickly and efficiently returns itself to this same state. Physicists really like to anthropomorphize systems, so it wouldn't be out of place for me to say, the system wants to be in equilibrium, or it likes having this particular set of flows. But the more accurate way to phrase it is that anytime we change this system, there is a physical mechanism in place to reverse that change. If you add water anywhere in this system, you'll find that the output flow goes up while the input flow stays constant, which means that you'll end up emptying out that extra water. Likewise, if you were to remove some water from somewhere in the system, the output would actually slow for the same input, so you'd end up building that water level back up. Water sloshing around through all of these little channels is a self-correcting system. This is also very closely related to Grady's awesome video on practical engineering about a month ago, where he had water flow on a sloped table. Every complex system like this has loads of different factors. Water flows and angles and little snippets of geometry that all feed back on each other and all talk to each other in complicated ways. But in many, many cases, all of these complicated factors end up canceling each other out and producing a stable system. It's time for the electricity again. This video is sort of a prologue to a longer video that I'm working on but have not finished about electricity and the hydraulic analogy and how you can use water to model electric current. I've been rewriting that script for the better part of a year now, so who knows? But this whole using physics to solve mazes thing was too fun of an opportunity to pass up. The 10 second explanation is that electrons, tiny subatomic particles that carry charge, flow through metallic wires much the same way that water flows through pipes. Electric current is literally a measure of how many electrons per second pass a certain location on a wire. So you're like moving electrons down a wire. In the water analogy, this would be something like a volumetric flow rate. So maybe milliliters of water per second. It's like the flow rate through a pipe. Electric potential or voltage, which is the other thing that is read out on this power supply, is equivalent to the height of the water at any given point in the maze. When I turn on this power supply, it's serving the exact same purpose as this water pump that was propelling water through the maze. It's doing two things. It's pulling electrons out of the bottom of the maze, and it's injecting electrons into the top of the maze. 
Now, when these electrons are pushed into the top of the maze, they end up sort of sloshing around and figuring out how to distribute themselves within the metal, building up in places and depleting in other places, eventually forming the exact same flow channel looking thing that formed in the water model. We'll have electric current that is tracing exactly one path through this maze, and all of the surrounding regions will end up being these flat mesas, depending on where they connect to the river. And just like with the water model, this doesn't happen instantly. Although the water model took many seconds in order to find its steady state flow condition. The electrons in this circuit are doing the exact same thing. It's just a whole lot faster. They spend a solid few nanoseconds sloshing around, feeling out every conceivable way that they could solve the maze before they settle into that steady state flow. I really wish that I had equipment that was fast enough to be able to sense that happening on this scale. Uh, shoot, I kind of want to try it though. Okay, darn it, let's go get the scope. I'll be sad if I didn't try. Okay, so now I've tapped into this maze with this oscilloscope, and I think that I have it set up properly to be able to see this transition, if we're gonna see it. And this is set up basically so that we're running electrons from the top to the bottom, just like normal, and where this clip comes in, that's where we're effectively measuring the height of the water. So, it's really hard to say what we're getting here. It looks like we start pouring electrons into the system and then it oscillates and eventually flattens off. But these are oscillations that are on the order of 50 nanoseconds, which is quite a long time. There's probably something happening inside of this power supply. On the other hand, if we zoom in, we can see that this signal itself has ripples and those ripples are on the order of maybe five nanoseconds, which is on the order of how long it takes light to travel down these wires. If we were actually seeing sloshing inside the circuit, we would expect to see some periodicity on the order of like a half a nanosecond, which is way faster than this thing is going to be happy reading. But we can still see the sloshing that's basically occurring in the lines on the way to the maze. As this circuit figures out just how many electrons can solve this maze in a certain amount of time. And maybe that's what is causing this little bit of a hiccup ripple. I don't want to say that that's exactly what's causing this little bit of a ripple right there, because I don't know. But a little bit of a ripple like that, on the order of maybe five nanoseconds, is what I would expect if such a thing were to occur. Okay, so it might have been a little bit too much to hope for to actually see the electrons sloshing around, but what we can absolutely measure with just a normal multimeter is the arrangement of the electrons once they're done sloshing. And I want to show you that it follows the exact same sort of descending staircase with plateaus on it thing that the water model did. I have this meter set up, generally speaking, so that larger negative numbers means that we have more negatively charged electrons in that part of the system. That's not exactly what voltage means, but for this purpose it's close enough. I've also tuned it. <laughs> Uh, better than I thought I would be able to, so that the top of the circuit is 110, just like the diagram that I drew, and the bottom of the circuit is zero, just like the diagram that I drew. So now we can go to any point within the circuit. All right, so that's minus 110 right there. And then here, we got minus 77. We go farther down the path, we're at minus 46, farther down the path, we're at minus 26, here we're at minus 1, <laughs> minus 3, and then we exit the maze. Now the cool thing is that within one of these plateaus, like this one over here that we looked at earlier, which is actually really entertaining, you can see it's totally separate the way that I can move the maze, at this junction, the voltage difference is 79 millivolts. When we go just a little bit past that junction, we're at about 78 millivolts. Here, we're at 78 millivolts. Here, we're at 78 millivolts. All the way down here at the bottom, we're at 78 millivolts. A little noisy. 
still at 78 millivolts. This whole thing is at the same voltage. And over here, let's look at the big difference because I think this was the border between the, the very tall water and the very short water in the maze, in the water maze. So here, we're at minus 71, and here it should be a lot shallower, minus five. <laughs> there we go. It's all the same. This works just like the water and for mostly the same reasons. The main difference between the water and electricity here is scale. In the water model, we had water exiting the maze at maybe four millimeters deep, but we had water entering the maze at something much higher, maybe 15 or 16 millimeters deep. This is a huge change. The water channels at the end of the maze were like 75% empty compared to the water channels at the top of the maze. In contrast, electricity tells a very different story. If you look at this piece of wire right here, that is the wire that exits the maze, every centimeter length of this wire contains approximately seven times 10 to the 20 free electrons. Now there are a lot more than that many electrons in that piece of wire, but the ones that are allowed to move about 10, seven times 10 to the 20, it's like 10 to the 21. If this was just like the water maze, at the other end of the circuit, where we're throwing electrons into the circuit, we would expect there to be something like four times as many electrons in any given centimeter of this wire. But that's not the case. In fact, it hardly changes at all. In this particular case, we're adding something like three million extra electrons for every centimeter of wire. If you cut a centimeter of wire out of this and you cut a centimeter of wire out of this, this one would have something like three million more electrons in it. But when you're comparing that against 7 billion billion electrons that were already there, you're really not changing that number very much. It is almost negligible. But I say almost very deliberately. It is enough to matter. I've had a lot of comments on other videos suggesting that electrons don't actually move or that they don't slosh around in circuits the same way that water sloshes around in a maze. And I think that the scale here gets confusing. Electromagnetism, the force that is causing these electron particles to move through wires in this maze, is so unbelievably massively stronger than gravity, the force that is causing water to, you know, round corners inside of this printed out maze, that we aren't used to thinking about it. Our brains are sort of wired for this large human scale gravity thing. And for that, you need really big changes because the force is pretty weak. But in electromagnetism, the slightest bit out of whack, the slightest perturbation, changes that feel like they should be infinitesimally small actually result in macroscopic effects, like a wire getting hot as electrons pass through it, despite the fact that the number of electrons on both ends of the wire is almost the same. <laughs> that is instantaneous. Oh my god, that's cool. Electricity would not work without electrons, charged particles, traveling long distances through electric conductors. These conductors, metallic wires like this one, only exist to constrain the motion of the charged particles in the same way that pipes constrain the motion of water. Okay, so my rant about electricity is over. You wanted to know what was going to happen with the split path circuits. These three mazes each have two solutions. The first one has two solutions of approximately equal length. One has pretty mismatched solutions and the last has extremely mismatched solutions. So this is your last chance to look at these three circuits and guess what's going to happen. Both paths. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. They're even the same, the same temperature. If we throw some electrons through the first maze, they take both paths about equally, heating up the foil and giving us this awesome thermal view. One of these paths is probably slightly more conductive than the other, but the electrons basically proportion themselves in half. If we throw a bunch of electrons into the start of the second maze, we see that they do not equally proportion themselves along the two paths. There is just a little bit of it that's taking the other path, but most of it 
is taking the shortest path. And none of it is going out here. <laughs> Most, but not all, of these electrons are taking the shorter path, the path of least resistance, which is really cool. But I want to be really clear that they are not all simply following the path of least resistance. I mean, how would they know what the path of least resistance even was? It starts with electrons flowing equally down both paths. But after a few nanoseconds, the electrons on one side have sort of backed up, just like the water model and eventually you reach this sort of steady state flow condition where some of the electrons are going this way and most of the electrons are going the other way. In fact, here is a water model that shows two different paths and there's more water flowing through the shorter route. If we realize that the water depth at the split is constant and the water depth at the recombination point is constant, but one of those paths is longer, then the water level must follow a shallower grade for the longer path and a shallower hill means that less water flows down it. And now for my favorite demo of the day. If we crank this to its absurd conclusion, it is possible to come up with a case where hardly any current flows the long way. <laughs> okay, the other path is officially too long. That's hysterical. That's just like, like all one. <laughs> I want to be clear that some current is still taking this long route, but it's not very much. And it really doesn't show up in the thermal camera. But while I was filming this, I had the urge to cut the line and watch what happened. I'm really tempted to cut that with a pair of scissors right now. So while I go find scissors, guess what's going to happen when I cut the short path and open that half of the circuit. Oh, that's so cool.